Last summer, as the federal government shopped around its small business tax reform agenda, phrases such as income sprinkling and marginal effective tax rate were splashed about as points of contention. And if that seemed a bit opaque, it's just part and parcel of what many see as an overly complicated tax system. With the U.S. abruptly overhauling its tax code late last year, is it time for Canada to readjust as well? Joining us now to consider that, in Calgary, Alberta, Lindsay Teds. She's a visiting professor in the School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary. And here in our studio, Bruce Ball, Vice President Taxation for the Chartered Professional Accountants of Canada, and Amin Mawani. He is Associate Professor of Accounting at York University's Schulich School of Business. And it's good to see you two gentlemen, I think, for the first time here on our program. Lindsay, good to have you on again. You've been on numerous times in the past. Let me do a, just a, sort of a couple of items of business here before we get started. We're sort of going to take a look at, at this from a, a personal, then a corporate, and then a system-wide standpoint. So we'll sort of take that path during the course of our discussion. And we just do also want to say for the record, you're from CPA Canada. Your provincial sister organization is a sponsor of this program, so we just throw that out there for everybody to know. Now, with that, here's John Iveson writing a couple of months ago in the National Post. The provincial update revealed that personal income tax revenues in the country's largest province, that's us, were downgraded to come in nearly $2 billion lower than forecast in the spring budget, despite an upgrade in projected economic growth. No explanation was offered for this unusual set of circumstances. Tax revenue should rise in a growing economy. But the suspicion is that high-earning Canadians are fed up seeing more than 50 cents on every dollar they earn, over 200000 taken by the taxman. In short, they are behaving exactly as all the studies on the subject predicted they would. They are increasingly engaged in what is known euphemistically as tax planning. Okay, Lindsay, start us off here. Is that what's going on here? Well, we actually are seeing the exact same results coming out of the numbers from British Columbia and Alberta, along with Ontario. So what we have to think about is when we have tax changes, we're going to have short-term shifts. Uh, and we've actually seen this before. As marginal tax rates are increasing, individuals who can shift their money into a low tax regi regime do so. We're still trying to figure out, though, whether or not this is a temporary shift or a permanent shift. I mean, how do you see it? Well, some of it might be due to uh, people anticipating the higher taxes and uh, accelerating some of their income in a previous period. So one period may not tell us that much. We, we need to see a couple of more periods right. to, to know for sure. Right. Bruce? No, well, actually, I agree with that. Uh, I just took a quick look at some numbers, and it does look like the year before was a little bit higher than they thought as well. And I can say for sure that a lot of uh, taxpayers and their advisors were looking at ways to try and move uh, as a you know a very simple thing, just move income back uh, from 2016 back into 2015 before the rates went up. So there was a lot of that going on. We knew about a month ahead, I think, that the changes were coming for sure, and a lot of people were taking steps to sort of uh, back off on deductions or bring income in early. Lindsay, does that suggest then that the attempt to realize more revenue by raising personal income taxes, as governments do from time to time, failed? Well, we know that it has caused a dent in the 2016 revenues. Again, we don't know whether or not this is a permanent or a temporary shift. We can look back throughout the data, and when we did tax reform in the 80s, we saw a temporary shift. So there's some evidence to suggest that this is just a, a, a one-year thing. But we do actually have to be concerned about the ability of high-income individuals um, being able to tax plan their way out of the policy intent of the tax rates that are being brought in. We have to be concerned about that for why? Well, it, because we're trying to achieve a number of different things with our tax policy. One of the things that we're trying to address is income inequality. And what, the individuals who are best able to tax plan are those individuals who we are seeing having increased growth in their income, and the individuals at the bottom are not seeing that same growth. So we are talking about tax policy as part of what I think in Ontario has been coined an inclusive growth strategy. Hmm. I do remember, this has got to be going back 30 years now, Bruce, that the finance minister of the day, Michael Wilson, federally, mm -hmm. said the problem with Canada is there just aren't enough super rich people to tax. Uh, is it fair to say that if you want to go after the well-off in this country, 
they have avenues by which to shelter income that others don't have, and therefore the policy on the face of it just isn't going to work. I think that that's part of it. I think part of it is probably the nature of their affairs, though, as well. They tend to have more complicated, I guess, situations. Generally, they may have corporations and other interests where they have more flexibility as well. Um, you know, I actually, uh, the Department of Finance federally reached out to a number of people, just asked them, uh, you know, what are the likely responses to the private company changes? And uh, so they wanted to get an idea, I guess, just generally what people were going to do. So uh, I think you do have more flexibility, though. And mm -hmm. I'd agree with Lindsay, it might be short term, some of it as well. Because, you know, some of the planning may have been, again, to advance money that they were going to take out the next few years anyway. Uh, well, so. I mean, let me follow up with this. You know, I do remember in the last federal election campaign back in 2000 and it was it 15 already? 2015. Um, Thomas Mulcair, the leader of the NDP, said, once you get personal income tax rates over 50 percent, it gets what he called confiscatory. And of course, people are going to try to avoid paying as much tax as possible. Is that what's here? I haven't seen any studies that show something magic about the 50% level. Uh, I mean, perhaps we should still, government should try and keep it below 50, perhaps uh, 49.5 and so on, in case there is some. But um, certainly I've not seen any studies that uh, compliance or lack of compliance dramatically increases after that number. Let me find out from Lindsay. Do you know of anything that says 50% is somehow a magic number and once you raise the income tax rates above that, it gets confiscatory and people really start to get focused on avoiding taxation as much as possible? Yeah, so that, the origin of that comment is actually in the Carter Commission, which is the commission that we formed in the 60s to do comprehensive tax reform. And it was based solely off of a, a feeling. I, we think it is a psychological barrier. Since then, of course, there's been a lot more work done by um, economists and others trying to look at the behavioral effects associated with tax reform. We do have an interesting study that um, Kevin Milligan is a co-author on that looks at whether or not it matters whether the uh, high tax rates are the result of federal reform or provincial reform. And the higher the provincial taxes are, we actually do see a little more mobility, whereas when the, when, when the majority of that tax is coming from the federal government, we don't see as much mobility. Uh, in, which, in which case, how either easy or difficult is it for uh, those who are extremely well off to manage their affairs to avoid paying higher income taxes if they want to do that? Well, I think what we're actually seeing is most of these behavioral changes are due to the result of uh, a corporate tax planning um, incorporating in Alberta as opposed to Ontario to um, uh, affect these tax changes. Okay, let me follow up on that because, of course, there was a huge kerfuffle last year for several months over the federal government's attempts to, as we suggested in the opening, cut down on the income sprinkling that goes on. Uh, you know, sort of go after these um, corporations where individuals have incorporated, like farmers or doctors or whatever. Um, obviously, the federal government wanted more revenue. Obviously, farmers, doctors, etc., were trying to resist paying uh, higher taxation. What's your view on uh, the right policy prescription in that case? Uh, yeah, that's it's actually a complicated issue. The, the one thing I'd say at the beginning, the government focused on three different areas, and there were legitimate tax issues or tax policy uh, issues to look at in each of them. I think part of the um, the reason why it became such a, a, a significant media event and uh, people were talking about it, though, is that uh, we would have liked to seen the government actually consult on it. So, say we have this problem, we think in the tax system. Yeah, you're saying they didn't? No, well. They said they were going to, and then uh, what happened was we had detailed legislation for two out of the three parts, and then a uh, fairly uh, detailed plan on the third part. So we would have liked to seen them come out and say, we think there are legitimate issues here, and what's the best way to deal with them? And I think that's sort of why the thing went sideways a little bit on them last year. Okay, don't talk to me about the politics, but talk to me about the actual policy. I mean, is it a good idea to try to cut back on the income sprinkling? Is it a good idea to chip away at individuals who want to incorporate to avoid paying tax? Uh, yes, every time you um, impose lower taxes, if you go around and do something like set up a corporation, uh, hire an accountant or lawyer, all those are dead weight costs to society. It would be best to be done without those things. Uh, ideal, uh, ideally, you want to go ahead as if you were in a world without taxes, and then you're taxed. Uh, you, you don't do anything different 
for tax planning. Mm -hmm. So accountants and lawyers are in some ways a deadweight cost to society and in some ways if you can minimize that. So the income sprinkling was a bit, uh, uh, I mean, uh, corporations, uh, this is all again to do with individual income tax. So that they, it was not... Mm -hmm. uh, but I guess I'm trying to find out, do you think the government was on the right track trying to cut down on these kinds of legal tax avoidance measures? I believe they, uh, they were. I think on the income sprinkling side, the arguments were uh, you're not retaining those funds in the corporation. So you're only, um, you're distributing it to your family members as dividends. Uh, so you're not reinvesting in the corporation. So it was really uh, tax, mo mostly tax motivated. Mm -hmm. And so one can argue that governments should do something about it for, in the, for the interest of neutrality or equity across different taxpayers, someone who can incorporate and someone who cannot. That's kind of why we wanted them to consult a bit, because there were issues there. But the flip side is that uh, these people, a lot of them worked in the business as well. So they were receiving dividends, they were contributing. And uh, the, the original mechanism, and they've amended it somewhat, but the core issues are still kind of present, is that you'd have to sort of evaluate the value that they uh, add to the business and compare it to the dividends. So uh, I think we'd agree there were issues there to deal with, but that's why we would have liked to see a consultation to come up with yeah. a, a way to do it that uh, makes sense from both fairness and uh, simplicity and compliance. I'm not sure, but I think he just called you dead weight. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> no, I heard that he? too. <laughs> you heard that too, right? I, I'm an accountant too. Uh, <laughs> oh, you're an accountant. Yes. Okay, so you're yeah. taking a shot yeah. at yourself yes. as well. Yes. Lindsay, can you weigh in on this? What's your view on the advisability of the government's attempt to um, cut down on what has been heretofore legal tax avoidance? Yeah, well, first I'll agree that the consultations on this were, were terrible. They were horribly done. And I think that the Department of Finance and the Government of Canada have learned a lot from that process about how to communicate with ordinary Canadians about complex tax reform. But in terms of what they were trying to accomplish, there is, in fact, uh, some underlying rationale there. We have an income tax system that, like it or not, is based on the individual, not the household. And so individuals with these private corporations were able to skirt around that notion and by income splitting, reducing their overall tax burden. And this wasn't available to other individuals individuals. So the individuals who are quite bully on income splitting are actually quite supportive of moving our system from an individual system to a household-based system. But there are real um, consequences of doing so. And most of the consequences fall on women who are the secondary earners who under a household system would then face higher marginal tax rates as soon as they enter the workforce. So we do have to have um, very solid conversations about our system our benchmark system, and that is why a lot of us through this process started calling for comprehensive tax reform. Okay, before, just before we go to comprehensive tax reform, I do want to follow up with you, Lindsay, on something we hear all the time, which is that if you raise personal income tax rates too high, people will simply leave the country. Do you have any evidence that that's in fact the case? We did a lot of studies back in the 90s when we were experiencing brain drain. There is very little evidence that it's tax rates that drive it. Uh, exchange rates, uh, opportunity, um, and particularly with the doctors, it was the underinvestment in healthcare in Canada that caused a lot of them to flee. So while there is some people who do respond to the taxes, overall it is not a key driver in, uh, in individuals leaving the country. Anything to add on that, Amin? Uh, yeah, uh, our higher Canadian tax rates do bias universal health care. Uh, good transit system, um, infrastructure, educated workforce, um, proven ability to attract immigrants and so on. So all of these things are valuable. There are lots of people moving in from countries that have lower tax rates than us and they're moving to, uh, to our country and not to the U.S. So. Let me, Bruce, follow up with you in, uh, coming right out of that sure. remark, which is if our high tax, higher than the Americans' tax rates, do pay for Medicare, do pay for public transit, do pay for our health care system, all of the, you know, good education system, all those things that we like. Should it still be the goal of every citizen of this country to pay as little tax as possible? Mm -hmm. 
Yeah, that's a good question. Actually, maybe a quick thing on the last point, too. I can't say that people are leaving Canada, but we certainly are hearing a lot more talk about people asking what's involved on that question anyway. And but I, I want to know I the guess, difference between talk and, and Yeah, that's leaving, the thing, you know? eh? Uh, when it comes time to pull the trigger, and I'm sure you look at all those different things. In terms of the tax planning part, yeah, that's, a, it's an in, that's an interesting discussion from the point of view. Uh, everybody's view on tax is a little, little bit different, too. Um, I personally, I think the best, um, state of affairs is a f straightforward tax system where it's clear uh, what your obligations are so it's consistent from person to person. Do we it, have that? Uh, we could do better. Um, I think the, that would be part of a review as well uh, to see are there areas that are could be more straightforward, that sort of thing, clearer, simpler, uh, mm -hmm. uh, more simple uh, to deal with. Right. Okay, that is the personal taxation part of our discussion. Let's now move over to the corporate taxation part of our discussion. And Lindsay, I'll start with you again, because of course the American Congress, uh, just before year end, passed probably the most significant uh, tax reform, corporate tax reform, in uh, one or two generations. And some people are suggesting with these new lower tax rates in the states, that Canada and, um, well, that many provinces are going to have to follow suit or we run the risk of being uncompetitive and losing jobs and business. What's your view on that? Well, I mean, one of the things with the U.S. tax reform is not all of the measures are permanent. Um, a number of them sunset. So like on the corporate tax side, one of the key measures is, of course, businesses being able to full expense um, uh, their expenses. And that actually has a sunset date. So I think if Canada is going to respond to this tax reform, we have to make sure we understand the difference between what's permanent and what's temporary. And sure Sure, the corporate tax rates themselves are uh, permanent in this, well, I mean, anybody can come along and change them, but they don't have a sunset date. And they are actually very similar to the uh, tax rates that we have combined federally and provincially. And I think that instead of competing on tax rates, we actually need to be competing on other sides of things and looking at the burden on businesses through uh, regulations uh, and other measures, not necessarily on tax rates. So if you were calling the shots, say, in the Premier's office or the Prime Minister's office, Am I hearing this right? You would tell them, don't sweat the tax rate stuff too much, but definitely get your red tape and regulations down? Uh, that would be my first reaction, absolutely. Okay. I mean, how much pressure is there on our governments to follow suit and reduce corporate taxes significantly as the Americans just have? Well, we are now roughly equal to their tax rates. We had a 14-point advantage for quite a number of years, and we did not see too many U.S. companies moving down here. So mm -hmm. now we are at par. There will be some pressure, no doubt. We have lost our 14-point comparative advantage. But uh, we have to, again, uh, go back and uh, emphasize our strengths of an much more educated workforce, transit, infrastructure, uh, health care, and all that. Mm -hmm. uh, I think, uh, yeah, at the margin, we might want to make some of our uh, tax depreciation more generous. So people who want to invest, companies that want to invest uh, in new equipment, uh, can write it off much faster than, uh, than otherwise, which is what the U.S. has done as well. But that only helps existing businesses. For startups, the big issue might be what happens when you have losses, maybe more generous ability to use up losses against other income, because you want to basically give an impact uh, on the downside if your business turns out to fail. Hmm. Uh, tax rates... Um, Lower tax rates only give you relief when you make the profits, but when you make the losses, you want some other mechanism, and that uh, incents you to take some uh, risk. Bruce, let's just put some real numbers on this. I, I think the Ameri if you combine the national and the state mm -hmm. corporate tax rates, you were up around, what, 35% or something like that yeah, before it, tax reform came in? It does vary quite a bit, but yeah, it went from 35 down to 21 federal, and then you have to add the, the state part into this it. This is in so, the U.S. In, in the, the U.S., US. Yeah. So anyway, that, that advantage that we had, that yeah. gap is now gone. That, yeah. So how much pressure is there on our governments to, to match what the U.S. has just done? Uh, I think outwardly there might be some. Uh, I'd agree, though, I, you have to look at rates, but a number of other issues, too. And the capital deduction, you know, being able to deduct in investments and, uh, in, uh, you know, capital expenditures and that kind of thing, that is a little more worrisome from the point of view that that's something new and a, it could be a significant difference between Canada and the U.S. That You know, things like that might be the bigger issue than the rates themselves. 
themselves. Hmm. But the, the other thing I'd worry a bit about in terms of uh, going, um, you know, jumping in and reducing rates without doing a full review is just making sure you get value for it as well. What does that mean? Well, there's a chance that you could actually lower what you're bringing in in terms of tax revenue and it doesn't have a significant impact in terms of you know, attracting businesses to Canada or uh, growth. So I think, again, we'd be looking, we're, we're hoping for, a, you know, an independent review of the tax system, and part of it will be comparing us to the U.S. especially, but other countries just to make sure we're competitive. Hold off on that. We're going to yep. get to that yep. coming up. Is, is it, uh, I mean, Lindsay, we're having an election in this province in June, and there's going to be a lot of pressure on, you know, all of the political parties to say what their position is, either on whether the corporate tax ought to be raised in the hopes of realizing more revenue, or lowered in the hopes of being more competitive with the United States. Um, I guess my question here is, do you think that people in Ontario, under, or for that matter across the country, understand that while these decisions may be local to them, there is actually a potential global set of consequences to whatever decisions our political leaders make? Boy, you're asking me if people really understand the tax system. I guess my answer is no. <laughs> uh, there, we, we really don't have um, at a at an ordinary everyday level um, a, a deep dive understanding of how all of these things interact, uh, and that is why we do have to make sure that we look very carefully at the evidence and approach tax reform from an evidence-based perspective. There are way too many myths out there about taxes and the effects on the economy and individuals, and we have to stop letting these myths drive tax policy. Well, let me follow up with you, Lindsay, because I guess what I'm referring to here is uh, there's a petition going on online right now, and more than 10,000 Canadians have already signed it, to the extent that you can sign an online petition. And the petition basically says, we want you to raise corporate taxes. Don't come after us, go after the corporations. And I'm wondering if you believe there is an understanding among the citizens of the country that it may be all well and good to say, we want to go to the Fortune 500 companies in this country and knock up their tax rates. But do they have an understanding of how that may render them uncompetitive when it comes to competing against other multinational companies to get business here in Canada? Well, I think the key uh, thing that people don't understand about the corporate tax system is that things don't pay taxes. People pay taxes. So when we levy the corporate tax, we have to make sure we know who's bearing the burden. Is it workers? Is it consumers? Or it's the shareholders? The intent of the corporate tax is actually to plug holes within taxation of shareholders. But when we look at the evidence, we know that some of that burden is actually falling on workers and consumers. And so raising corporate tax rates may seem palatable because you you don't have to pay them, and that's how we seem to engage in tax reform. As long as it doesn't affect me, um, then it's good. Uh, but it does in fact affect you as, as workers and consumers as well, as we're mostly all shareholders through pensions and investments in these corporations. And so we have to approach it from that perspective, not that um, you know businesses should bear a, a bigger burden because we don't see where that tax incidence falls. I mean, I'll give you, Amina, a, a, a real life example here. I do remember talking to Elise Allen, who was the president of General Electric in Canada, and her view was, if you want to raise corporate taxes, that's fine, but you better reduce something else in my costs, or else there's not a chance that my GE Canada is going to be able to compete against GE and any of the other dozens of countries it's in around the world to get that kind of business. True. You know, first of all, tax cuts are not the only part of tax reform. There's a tax base. Uh, in the case of GE, uh, they have customers here in Canada, that, uh, um, so they are trying to, uh, you know, w one of the things that we have to offset with the tax rates is the tax subsidies. There's a lot of tax expenditures aimed as, at businesses. Uh, just federally alone, there's a $14 billion, $14 billion worth of tax subsidies going to businesses. Provincially, there's another same amount. How much of that $14 billion do you think is actually useful? Oh, it's hard to say. You see, we don't do program evaluation. Like, for example, I believe the R&D tax credit is 3.3 billion. Uh, often these things are offered to the tax system as deductions or credits. And unlike direct government spending, often it's not evaluated on a year-to-year -year basis to see if the benefits exceed the cost. 
So that's uh, one issue. Somebody should be doing that. Someone should be, uh, absolutely. Whose job should that be? Is that the Auditor General's job or what? Uh, yes, the Auditor General has raised the issue that it should be done more thoroughly and, and the parliamentarians should look at it to see if it ought to be retired. There should be a sunset provisions to some of them. Uh, and remember, every, for example, for the small businesses, uh, doing R&D, 43 cents of every dollar um, is funded by the government. That Through a what, tax subsidy. Uh, yes. Mm -hmm. Now, that requires higher taxes on the other small businesses to pay for those who are doing the R&D. Hmm. And that dollar of spending includes real R&D outflows as well as accountants and lawyers' fees. So maybe <laughs> the real R&D was 90 cents and the 10 cents was the accountants and lawyers. And what I'm trying to say is, so it was not 43 cents on the dollar, but 43 cents on the 90 cents, perhaps. Gotcha. So it's more than we actually think it is. Right. Right. You want a last word on this? If I could just chime in there, there was actually a paper uh, released uh, last week. It was authored by uh, John Lester, um, pushed out by the uh, School of Public Policy at the University of Calgary, who looked at the cost-benefit analysis of business subsidies at the federal level and four provinces, and he found that only about a third of those business subsidies satisfy the cost-benefit analysis. So two-thirds are done for political reasons then? satisfy some constituency. Got it. That's Bruce, correct. you wanted to add? Yeah, a couple things. Uh, the government did do an expenditure review, I guess, uh, either last year or the year before. Um, I, you know, that would be something we'd like to see as part of a review, a more general review, just make sure these incentives are, are, are actually working like the public transit one was discontinued, I think, because it seemed to be having little impact on uh, what the, people do. The little subsidy Harper, yeah. Stephen yeah. Harper brought in as Prime yeah. Minister to get yeah. people to ride the Public transit more. And I think that is important just to go look at whether these uh, incentives or expenditures are doing their job. In terms of the tax rate, uh, the uh, I agree with what Lindsay was saying in terms of it being a, a cost to the business. If you're a profitable business, it's a cost along with other things. So the one thing I'd be worried about, you know, uh, uh, taxpayers may not understand, and I agree with that. I doubt they understand the corporate system very well. But the flip side is if we ended up uh, underperforming in Ontario in a couple of years because of a tax Tax increase again the taxpayers would want an answer on that too right. so okay we've done personal income tax rates we've done corporate income tax rates and let's do the third part of our little three-legged stool here uh, in our remaining moments and that is a review of the entire Canadian tax system uh, Lindsay what you point out hasn't been done in half a century it was the Carter Commission I think you said back at the beginning of our discussion that uh, sort of took that on all those years ago and no political leader has deigned to go back there since how come well, I think you can see the reaction to the um, changes that were put for forward in the summer on the small business side as to why this is a um, a political hot button. Uh, when you're talking about comprehensive tax reform, you're going to be talking about, you know, hopefully changing the benchmark system, uh, it's talking about reducing, um, you know, these, these deductions and subsidies. And so in the end, what ends up happening is individuals get riled up about the, their favorite part of the tax system, rather than thinking about the overall benefits of what we're trying to achieve. So it is a hot button item and we have to talk about things that we may not like to and we have to do it with a different lens. While it is controversial amongst some groups, it isn't amongst people like myself. When we do tax reform this time, we have to make sure that we understand gender-based analysis as well as racial and income inequality. So it will be a very different kind of tax reform to ensure that everybody benefits as opposed to just a small subset of society society who is able to, um, to, to input themselves in these conversations. Just follow up on that if you would. What, what, why does the tax system care about gender and or whether you're a visible minority or not? Well, the tax system is typically set up by a certain type of individual, and the tax system favors their behavior over other individuals' behavior. And, you know, when you look at tax reform that was done in the 60s, it was dominated by white men. And so their behaviors are preferred under the tax system. And we have to make sure that when we engage in public policy, that we ensure that we understand everybody's contributions to society Society, that we understand the burdens and benefits that they bear and that they are evenly distributed across everybody. Now let's see, do we have a white man here we can follow up with? Bruce, that would be you. <laughs> do you think the tax code at the moment is sort of quote unquote fixed to favor white men over others? That's, I think I'm hearing that from Lindsay. Is that, is that accurate, Lindsay? 
I am saying that the contributions to tax reform typically come from one particular lens and additional lenses need to be applied under any modern day tax reform. For example, in the 60s, the majority of women uh, stayed at home and worked in our, our, our tax, our, stayed at home and worked within the household. And now the majority of women work. We have to make sure when we have these conversations, we understand how things have changed and how different people are contributing to the economy. Bruce. Yeah, no, I agree with it. I agree with that comment generally. I guess my our view would be that there's three key things we'd like to see the tax system take into account as part of a review. Um, try to make it, uh, simplify it, try to make it fair. And I think that discussion goes to fairness. Uh, you know, people should be treated. And fair doesn't necessarily mean exactly equal, but fair in uh, when you compare situations and it needs to be competitive. Those would be the three things we'd be looking at. Would you, would you include gender and, um, you know, visible minority status as a, as a benchmark in that I, fairness? I think you'd have to consider that as part of the process. I, I agree with the lens aspect of it. You need to sort of step back and make sure it makes sense uh, from all points of view and not just one. Mm -hmm. uh, I think that was the big issue actually around the private company business last year. There was a lot of discussion around just one point. How is this going to affect a certain group of people as opposed mm -hmm. to sort of stepping back and saying, you know, should... Uh, uh, we're doing this because there are problems with the tax system. Should we step back and see what makes sense? Okay, so, so fairness is one. What, what would two other things be? Uh, simplicity and uh, competitiveness. Those are. Uh, there's a number of other issues, but those are the three key ones. And it was actually part of the uh, Senate Finances Committee report as well. Uh, we uh, uh, made representations to the Senate as part of the uh, private company changes, but we were talking about uh, comprehensive review as well, and those were the points. I mean, we, if you're looking at comprehensive review of the tax system? What are you looking at? Uh, well, there's so many moving parts and uh, meaningful tax reform takes a long time. Uh, taxes have never been popular, but uh, tax policy should take a little bit more time. Just to talk about the last one, the Carter Commission one, it was started under in 1962 under Prime Minister Diffenbaker, completed under Prime Minister uh, Lester Pearson, and then the legislated under Pierre Trudeau in 72, so 10 years. The world moves very fast now. So chances are we will be doing smaller tax reforms like, or, or components of it like we did last year, whether successful or not. Um, I, I think just, uh, uh, I'm not sure about the racialized, but the gender one would be easy to see. You see, dividend sprinkling by, CC, by Canadian small companies requires you to have family members. What if you're single? Hmm. So then you don't have those opportunities that a person with a family and nephews and children have. So you don't have those options to sprinkle. Yes, and therefore single. you're paying higher taxes. So right. there's inequity. So what we need is uh, horizontal equity, likes. I mean, perhaps I would be on, on the side of uh, allowing uh, sprinkling if academics were allowed to incorporate, but they're not. <laughs> uh, but I see my physician friends being allowed to incorporate, but academics aren't. Uh, I get so the same uh, employment income with no uh, opportunities of that. Uh, then, of course, yes, there's efficiency or competitiveness. Uh, we need to be competitive with others. And simplicity, the first Income Tax Act, uh, we just uh, uh, celebrated the 100th anniversary of the Income Tax Act in September 2017. Is, is celebrated the right word? Uh, <laughs> Observed. Uh, well, uh, you know, it is um, uh, the cornerstone of civilization. We need that. Uh, <laughs> okay. Uh, and uh, the first act was 11 pages long. Right now, it's about this much, mm -hmm. uh, three, uh, two or 3,000 pages. Simple. I've uh, got to jump in, friends, because that's so, our time, I'm afraid. But I, I'm uh, delighted to welcome you all to TVO tonight, and I thank you for your contributions. Lindsay Ted's good to have you on the line again from the University of Calgary, where she is a visiting professor in the School of Public Policy at the university. Bruce Ball, Vice President of Taxation at CPA Canada. Amin Mawani, Associate Professor Accounting, Schulich School of Business at York University. Thanks, everybody. Thank you. Thank you. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. Helping businesses stay on the right side of change with strategic thinking, insightful decisions, and business leadership. Are you on the right side of change? Ask an Ontario CPA.